In this lesson, we'll look at dimensional analysis, also known as factor label method, for doing unit conversions and some stoichiometry. Please have your note sheet, calculator, and periodic table handy. Dimensional analysis can be used to convert measurements. Remember, measurements are quantitative observations. They consist of a number and then some kind of unit. In science, we use the International System of Units, or SI system. These units are metric units, and they are listed here. Please learn these if you don't know them already. An advantage of the metric system is that you can apply these prefixes to any base unit to change the size of the unit. Please make sure you know kilo and centi through pico. Prefixes like nano and pico are useful to describe the sizes of atoms, molecules, nuclei, etc. when you apply them to the base unit of the meter. So now let's talk about how to use dimensional analysis to do metric conversions. We want to go through some basic steps here when we're using dimensional analysis. We need an equivalence statement. So that might be something like, uh, if you remember from first year chemistry, uh, one mole of carbon is equal to 12.01 grams. Then we're gonna look at the units we have and the units that we want. And the whole idea behind dimensional analysis is to cancel unwanted units. And then we'll do our math, our multiplication and our division. So let's say we want to convert 294.5 nanometers to centimeters. Well, we're going to use two equivalent statements. Um, we're going to look at going from uh, nanometers to meters, the base unit, and then from meters to centimeters, the desired unit. We just need to figure out how to set these up so that we can cancel the units that we don't want and find the units that we do want. So I'm going to start with my 294.5 nanometers. I'm going to put that over 1. I'm going to make it into a fraction. And then um, I want to cancel the nanometers. I want to get rid of them. Um, so because they're in the numerator, I'm going to put nanometers in the denominator of my factor. We're going to use one of the equivalent statements here. 1 meter is 10 to the ninth nanometers. So the nanometers have canceled, and now I'm left with just meters. But I want centimeters, so I'm going to set up another factor. Cancel my meters. Meters in the numerator, so I'll put meters in the denominator, and go to centimeters. So meters have canceled, and I'd be left with centimeters. 100 centimeters in one meter. So I used my two equivalent statements, and now I can do my math. I get 2.945 times 10 to the negative fifth centimeters. I use the same number of significant figures as 294.5 nanometers. In this next example, we'll look at how density can be used as an equivalent statement or a factor in our dimensional analysis problem. Because the mass of the rectangular block is given in kilograms, we will use an equivalent statement that allows us to convert to grams because density has grams in it in this problem. And this is how we will use density as an equivalent statement. 22.57 grams equals one cubic centimeter when you're talking about a density of 22.57 grams per cubic centimeter. So we'll start with our one kilogram cancel the kilograms and go to grams. There's 1,000 grams in a kilogram. And now we can use our density to cancel our grams. So grams in the numerator, we want grams in the denominator. And then we'll put cubic centimeters in the numerator. 
one cubic centimeter of osmium has a mass of 22.57 grams. So now our grams have canceled and we're left with cubic centimeters. And so that's our volume. We get 44.3 cubic centimeters, but that's not the question. We want the third dimension of the block given the two other dimensions as four by four centimeters. Of course, the volume of a rectangular block would be length times width times height. So four times four times x will give us our volume. And if we solve for x, we get 2.77 centimeters. I use three significant figures because all the numbers in the problem had three significant figures. Now let's look at using dimensional analysis for some stoichiometry problems. If you remember, we'll use um, a chemical equation to help us predict quantities of reactants and products in stoichiometry. If you remember, we're always going to want to have a balanced chemical equation, and then we can use the coefficients as our mole ratio. Sometimes, though, before we can utilize uh, a mole ratio, we have to do some converting. Uh, these problems will be looking at uh, mass and converting that to moles, but certainly there are some other options, such as uh, gas volume, molarity, that kind of thing. So we can use dimensional analysis to uh, convert you know, mass to moles, and then we can use our mole ratio in dimensional analysis, and then we can go back to grams if we need to, or any other unit. So when we're doing stoichiometry with mass, we'll, we'll have the mass of a known substance, we'll convert it to moles, then we can use our mole ratio to find the moles of our desired substance, and then we'll convert it back to grams. In this example, we have 6.25 grams of phosphorus, and we would like to know the mass of oxygen that's reacted. So we want to cancel the units of grams of phosphorus, and in order to use a mole ratio to switch from phosphorus to oxygen, we need to convert to moles. We'll need the molar mass for phosphorus times 4, because it's P4. Remember with the molar masses, let's do two decimal places. So our grams of phosphorus are canceled, and now we have our moles of phosphorus. Now we want to cancel our moles of phosphorus and go to moles of oxygen. We'll use our mole ratio. If we looked at the balanced chemical equation for every one mole of phosphorus, there are five moles of oxygen reacted. So now we've gotten rid of our moles of phosphorus, and we have our moles of oxygen. But we don't want to end with moles of oxygen. We want mass. So for every one mole of oxygen, there are 32 grams. So it's O2. Uh, so 2 times the molar mass for the oxygen. Now the moles of oxygen are gone. We have grams of oxygen left, and that's going to be our final answer. We get 8.07 grams of oxygen. Because the original mass of phosphorus had three significant figures, I put three significant figures in my answer. I'd like for you to try this problem. Probably need to think about this one a little bit more but what mass of ammonia would produce the same amount of water as one gram of methane reacting with excess oxygen. So you can see that both equations have water in them. Ammonia, by the way, is NH3. That's what you're trying to find. It's good to know that ammonia is NH3. And you have one gram of the methane to start with. Methane is CH4, another good one to know. So pause for a moment and try to work out this problem. Okay, so I'm going to call this equation 1 and this equation 2, and you'll see why here in just a minute. But I'm going to take my 1 gram of methane, cancel the grams, and find moles of methane so I can do some stoichiometry. So 1 mole of methane 
produces two moles of water. in the first equation. Now we also want to have the same amount of water in the second equation. Remember amount is moles. So for every six moles of water in the second equation, four moles of ammonia are produced. And now we just need to convert from moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia. And we get 1.42 grams of ammonia. Since we're talking about stoichiometry, let's review the idea of limiting reactants. If you remember, that is the reactant that runs out first in a chemical reaction and it will influence the amount of product that is produced. So if we have this reaction that shows the production of ammonia and our small molecules here are hydrogens and the larger molecules here are nitrogens, we can uh, look at how they combine to form ammonia. You can see for every one molecule of nitrogen we need three molecules of hydrogen and that's what we see circled here in the first diagram. And then we see our molecules, our two molecules actually, uh, in each of the uh, circled areas in our after diagram. And you can see that there's some excess nitrogen, some there wasn't enough hydrogen to form more ammonia molecules. So there's our excess reactant. And then that means that the hydrogen was the limiting reactant. It influenced the amount of ammonia molecules that were produced. I'd like you to take a moment and think about this problem here. Which of the following reaction mixtures could produce the greatest amount of product? Okay, now that you've had time to think about it, for every two moles of hydrogen, one mole of oxygen needs to react. So if you actually look at these first two right here, A and B, you have two moles of hydrogen and you have more than enough oxygen. So we're talking about in each of those forming two moles of water. Our oxygen is our excess reactant. If you look at letter C, we've got two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen. That is the exact ratio that they need to react in. And so once again, we get two moles of water. And in letter D, three moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen. This time the oxygen is the limiting reactant. We have more than enough hydrogen, so that's our excess. And uh, one mole of oxygen will again produce two moles of water. So the answer here is E they will all produce the same amount of product. In this example, notice how we're given masses of each of the reactants. So this is a limiting reactant problem. If we want to find the mass of the product that will be produced, we need to know which reactant will limit the amount of product that's produced. So if you look in your textbook, there's a, a couple of approaches that you can take. Um, since we're going to be solving for uh, the mass of the product, I'm going to convert. I'm going to use stoichiometry to convert um, to uh, mass of our product. And then we'll do a comparison. So I'm going to take my 10 grams of A. I want to convert to moles so I can do some stoichiometry, so I can look at how much of C would be produced. So I cancel my grams and go to moles of A. I cancel my moles of A and go to moles of C. Uh, for every one mole of A, we get two moles of C. And then I want to convert to grams. I want the mass of the product. So the molar mass for C was 25 grams per mole. We get 50 grams of C that would be produced if all of uh, 10 grams of A reacted. I'm going to do the same thing now for 10 grams of B. I cancel 10 grams of B and go to moles of B. Now notice it's a different molar mass. And my mole ratio is also different. Uh, for every 3 moles of B, I get 2 moles of C. 
So 10 grams of B will produce 8.33 grams of C, and the limiting reactant, therefore, is B. It limits the amount of product that can be produced, and so this is the mass of the product that would be produced. Uh, a would be our excess reactant. And since we're talking about how much product should be produced, let's review percent yield. The theoretical yield, remember, is what should be produced. Um, that's based on stoichiometry. So like the last problem we just did. And then the actual yield is what you actually get in the lab or from your experiment. And if you take the ratio of those two, multiply by 100, you get percent yield. Remember, we like to have high percent yields. Please take a moment to work out this problem, and we'll go through the answer in class.